All right, let's open the Word of God this evening to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 5, verses 12 to 21. In a sermon that I have entitled, What Happened at the Fall? What Happened at the Fall? And as I get into this text... I want to begin, and and our focus will be on the first verse, verse 12. I want to begin by just reading verse 12, because I fear that if I read through verse 21, and you don't grasp the weight of Romans 5, verse 12, truly one of the most important verses in the New Testament, if you don't grasp the weight of it, you're going to miss what the theological argument and what is being said in the following Verses. So let's start with Romans 5 verse 12 and consider it and then move through the rest of the passage. Hear now the word of the one true and living God. Romans 5 verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. Now in this verse... We have so much theology packed in. Now, I remember, um, I, I think I have it in my office, but I didn't look to find it. But I remember that many years ago, um, I, I, was at, I was at this thing, it was on American history, and I won't go into all the details of it, but they had some books from the colonial era. And these are reprints, they're not actually books from the 1700s, uh, because those are more valuable and people don't give, give those away. Uh, and so it was a reprint of a children's primer from the American colonies in Massachusetts and Connecticut in particular. Is anybody familiar with that children's primer? It's very famous in American history. So in the early colonies, the children's primer, it, the, the, the beginning of childhood education, because you know how Christians school their children in early colonial America, right? In homeschool, that's all he had. And um, as they would teach their children the alphabet, A to Z, each letter started with something from the Word of God. And so we see J talked about Job and N about Noah. But the first letter, the first one that I read, really stuck out to me. This was, this was 2010. No, 2011, I had just graduated from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, and I pick up this children's primer to teach young children in colonial America the alphabet, and for the letter A, it started, in Adam's fall, can you complete it? What does it say? In Adam's fall, we sinned all. Now, here I am, a recent seminary graduate, starting to learn the theology of the Protestant Reformation, a young pastor in my early 20s, believe it or not, and as I read, in Adam's fall, we send all, I thought, that's, that's interesting. What does that mean? I mean, I wasn't there in the garden. I didn't commit an act of sin. What, what does that mean? Well, I'm going to teach you tonight from Romans 5, why the children's primer says that, and why it is indeed theologically accurate, biblical, profound, and largely unheard of and unknown in our day. Now, Pastor Aaron earlier mentioned the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith. Now, church members, just so you know, I just shortened that and I call it the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith. The longer title is the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith. And so uh, the confession of faith that we are studying to adopt as our statement of faith here at First Baptist Church of Livingston is this one. Now, this is a reprint from Founders Press. It's in modern English. It's a little bit easier to read. It was originally authored in the year 1677 and adopted by... uh, early Baptist churches in the year 1689 when they met in London and adopted this as their confession of faith. This was the confession of faith of Charles Haddon Spurgeon. In early English and American Baptist history, they just referred to this as the Baptist confession of faith. It's not that there weren't other confessions of faith that other Baptists used, such as General Baptist, but the overwhelming majority of Baptists throughout England and America in the, uh, in the 17th and 18th centuries 
they were churches that held to this. In fact, there were about 293 churches represented in the year 1845 when the first messengers met in Augusta, Georgia to found a new convention of churches called the Southern Baptist Convention. You ever heard of it? It's the largest denomination in America. We say it's not a denomination, but who are we kidding? Anyways, the point is, the point is this. It's not technically a denomination. I won't go into that now. Uh, We do hold uh, to Baptist polity. But when the Southern Baptist Convention was founded, they did not write a new statement of faith. They just said, this is our statement of faith. And from 1845 to 1925, when the first Baptist faith and message was written, the first 80 years of the Southern Baptist Convention, this was the confession of faith that early Baptists and Southern Baptists used. That's why it was just called the Baptist. This just represented what Baptists believed for centuries. Now, there were other Baptist groups, but they were much smaller. And the overwhelming majority of Baptists held to these doctrines. And what I'm going to preach to you about what happened at the fall tonight. This was known by children from the earliest age. Literally five-year-olds understood this. And now today in America, most seminary graduates don't understand this. In fact, I hate to say it, but many of our Southern Baptist seminary professors, some of these men who I'm friends with, that I hope if they hear this sermon, I get the opportunity to discuss it with them further. And I likely will, and I look forward to that. But they don't hold to the historic Protestant understanding of what happened at the fall, what we call the doctrine of original sin. And the first thing I want you to understand is when we say original sin, we're not talking about the first sin that Adam committed in the garden. We're talking about the effects of that sin upon us and all of creation. Okay. When we talk about original sin, we're talking about how the fall affected us. In Adam's fall, we send all is essentially summarizing the theology of Romans 5 verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all have sinned. Now, the theologian and biblical scholar, uh, Richard Longenecker, in his New International Greek Testament commentary, uh, if you can't read Greek, don't buy it, uh, because it's a very technical commentary, but he provides, I think, one of the best translations of exactly what the, the way the, the, the Greek text in Romans 5.12 reads, the way the syntax works in the text, it is, it is very deliberate, it is very specific, and Richard Longenecker translated it this way, and it, it doesn't read as smoothly, but it is exactly following what the Greek text says. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world through that sin, the sin of Adam, and the Greek text is emphatic here, through that sin, the sin of Adam, came death. And thus death permeated or spread throughout all humanity and on the basis of which the permeation of sin throughout all humanity On the basis of which all have sinned. I want you to understand. You'll see in in Romans 5.12 and the verses that follow as Paul explains what he means here. He's not saying merely that Adam sinned and Adam's sin gives us a sinful nature. Now that is true. That is right, that is biblical, that is good. But that's not all that's being said here in Romans 5.12. Yes, we have inherited a sin nature from Adam. But there's another theological doctrine, and it's the one that many Southern Baptists no longer affirm. That many Southern Baptist seminaries and professors today are writing theological treatises against. A doctrine that was believed by Baptists in our earliest days and has been eschewed by many today, and it is the doctrine of imputed guilt through Adam's sin. Now this is taught in the text, and I will show you this, What we are not saying, let's just start with what we're not saying. When we talk about in Adam's fall, we sinned all. When we talk about imputed guilt, I'm not saying that you committed Adam's sin in the garden. You weren't born yet. I realize you're not the one who did it. But what I am saying, building on what Brandon said earlier, is that in the garden, through the covenant that God made with Adam, he was your federal head. He represented you. 
And when we talk about federalism within that covenant that God made with Adam, Adam was your representative. Now you say, well, that doesn't sound right. How am I being held accountable for what Adam did in the garden? How does that affect me? How is the guilt of Adam and his sin imputed to me because he represents me? That's not right. That's not fair. Well, first off, I'm going to show you in the text of Scripture that if you reject this doctrine, you can just give up all hope of salvation through Jesus Christ. Because you can't have imputed righteousness without imputed guilt. And that's exactly what Paul is going to tell us in this text. But, but also, brothers and sisters, when we think about the fall, the, the reason why the rest of our soteriology goes wrong is because we don't understand what happened at the fall. So here's what I want to do. Before we work through the rest of the text, when, when we read... That sin came into the world through the one man, Adam, and death through sin, and death spread to all men because all sinned. That's in the past tense. In the garden, the sin of Adam and his guilt was imputed to us before we were born. This is why we are conceived in sin, according to Psalm 51. We, we don't merely become sinners because we have sinned. That's not the way the Bible sets it forth. We sin because we are sinners by nature. You understand that? We we sin because we are sinners. We don't come into this world as innocent little creatures. We come into this world as sinners by nature in rebellion against a holy, perfect, righteous God who created us in his image. And here we are rebelling against our king and creator. And Aaron, I, I do, Vodi has influenced me so much, and most people have heard this before, but he said it well about that little infant. That's not an innocent little child, as Vodi has said. That's a viper in a diaper. <laughs> you need to understand. Now, I know, Brandon, your little daughter, baby Ruth, 25 days old? 25 days old. She's beautiful, but she is a sinner in need of the Savior. Amen? Amen. That's how we all came into this world. And the only one who wasn't born in sin is the God-man who left his throne in heaven, God the Son, eternal God, who took on human flesh in the incarnation. And when he came into this world, the Bible is emphatic. He was conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary. Why is this important? Because he was not conceived as we are. He was supernaturally placed in the womb of the Virgin Mary by the Holy Spirit of God. And therefore, the guilt of Adam and his sin nature was not imputed to Christ. You see, if Christ were not conceived by the Holy Spirit supernaturally, then Christ could not be sinless and therefore be our perfect Savior. If he is not the spotless lamb... His sacrifice cannot cover our sins. He did not die for his own sins. He had none. He did not die for his own guilt of sin. He had none. Our sin was imputed to him at the cross. And his righteousness is imputed to us by faith in Christ. That's another doctrine, double imputation. So we've talked about the imputation of Adam's guilt to all who are in Adam. And all are in Adam except... For the Lord Jesus Christ. All other people who have ever lived. And yes, Mary was a godly woman. But she as well was conceived in sin. That's why she calls the Lord God her Savior in the Gospel of Luke. Because we are conceived in sin and we come into this world already guilty through our federal head, Adam. You say, well, I don't like this doctrine of federal headship. You know, it's interesting. The founders of this nation, they, they, look, they weren't all card-carrying Baptists or Presbyterians. Uh, some of them held a deism and not even truly Christian theology. Uh, but there was one thing that they understood. They understood federalism. And, 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 and coming out of the Middle Ages, where, where kings and kingdoms were more a common part of ancient Europe, uh, this made a little more sense to them. In our day, we, we are so far removed from that political system that we, we really don't grasp and understand it. 
But when they founded the U.S. federal government in the United States Constitution, they were taking this biblical principle of federalism found in Genesis chapter 1, and they were applying it in how our federal government was structured. Adam represented you in the garden, and his sin and its guilt becomes your guilt, and you are fallen in sin, and you say, well, that's not fair. You know, when we elect these people to U.S. Congress, what are they called? They are called, in the House of representatives. It's federalism. Brothers and sisters, the founders of this nation understood this. The children in early America, this was taught to them in the first letter of the alphabet. In Adam's fall, we send all. And yet many theologians and pastors and seminary professors don't understand this today. What has happened to us? We're literally, in some respects, five-year-olds used to have better theology than our seminary professors in America. This is a grievous thing, brothers and sisters. What has happened to us that that, that we've ignored or forgotten or never even seen much of the theology taught in Scripture? A few more comments about verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, sin came into the world through one man. What does that mean? There was no sin before Adam sinned. Which means... In the state of innocence, it was totally different than what happened at the fall. There was a point at which sin came into the world. And prior to that point, Adam was in a state of innocence. He was not fallen. He did not have a sinful nature. As Augustine said, Adam was able to sin, but he was also able not to sin. But what happens in the fall is Adam's nature and all of his posterity after him, all who are in Adam, which is all humans except for Jesus, all who came after Adam inherit his sin nature and the guilt of his sin. And it says, and death came into the world through that sin in the garden. You see that in the text? Just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. Now this is one of the reasons... I'll just throw out another doctrine here. We're being controversial tonight. Brandon touched on it earlier, so I say amen. Romans 5.12 teaches that there was no death before the fall. Do you see it in the text? Just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. This is one of the reasons that I, some years ago, wasn't long after I began discovering this doctrine and more carefully studying the book of Romans and Genesis, and many other parts of the Bible, that I became convinced that the Bible does, in fact, teach a young earth. Now, I know people laugh at this today. I used to mock and ridicule and make fun of this. I'm not going to preach extensively on this tonight. I just want to tell you the straightforward meaning of this text is there was no death in the world prior to the fall. How in the world can you have animal predation and death prior to sin entering the world when Adam sinned in the garden? That does not mix with Romans 5 verse 12. Sin came into the world through one man and death through sin and so death spread to all men. That's us. Because all sinned in reference to Adam's sin in the garden. Paul goes on to explain... Verse 13, for sin was indeed in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. You see, when Adam came into the world, the law at Mount Sinai had not yet been given. That would not be for another approximately 4,500 years, according to the biblical chronology. And so, for the first four and a half millennia, excuse me, not four and a half, two and a half, um, for, so for the first... Um, two and a half millennia, what we see is that Adam lived in a time before the giving of the law in Moses' day. And Paul says in verse 13 that sin is not counted where there is no law. Now, Paul is going to go on and make the argument in Romans. He started to make it. He'll continue to make it as the letter of Romans develops that we need the law to show us how guilty we are in our sin and our need of the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. But the point here is also that the law was written on Adam's heart. He knew right from wrong, even without the Ten Commandments. The law was written on his heart already. 
The law came so that the trespass would increase and man would see his guilt before a holy God in his need of a savior. So Paul goes on in verse 14, yet death reigned, death reigned, death ruled, death had dominion in many ways, not complete, not total, yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. You know, Augustine and Thomas Watson, they didn't make up this doctrine. Look at verse 14. Death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam. He's talking about the first two of the four stages of man here. Over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam. As Augustine explains, Adam was able not to sin. Fallen man is only able to sin. Fallen man is by nature a sinner. Fallen man is incapable of doing good. Uh, Paul goes on to explain this. I'll read briefly in Romans chapter 8, verses 7 and 8. Paul says, For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And in the Greek text, the verb here, it cannot, is dunamai, to have the power or capability or ability to do something. Romans 8, verse 7 says that sinful man cannot submit to God's law. Sinful, fallen man, lost man is incapable of obeying God. That's what Romans 8, verse 7 says. And then in verse 8, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. If anything is pleasing to God, the fallen sinful man in and of his own ability cannot do it. He cannot please God. Does faith in Christ please God? It absolutely does. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Fallen sinful man is incapable of saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ in and of himself. Come tomorrow morning and hear Chad preach on the doctrine of regeneration to learn more about that. Now, getting back to Romans 5, we work through verse 14. And what we saw in verse 14 was that The sin of those between Adam and Moses was not like the transgression of Adam. They were not in a state of innocence and able not to sin the way that Adam was. But after the fall, everything changed. And then he says that Adam was a type of the one who was to come. Now hold on to that because Paul's about to explain what he means at the end of verse 14. But before I go there, I just want to prove, I want to demonstrate to you that, again, we didn't make up these doctrines. Protestants, including Baptists, but also you find the same thing in the Westminster Confession of Faith, representing Presbyterian theology. You find the same thing in the Savoy uh, Declaration of Faith, representing Congregationalist theology and men like Jonathan Edwards. What you need to understand is that they saw this long before we ever showed up on the scene and forgot this theology. So I'm going to read from the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith, but this also represents what's found in the Westminster and the Savoy and other Reformation, post-Reformation statements of faith. But I want you to hear, and I believe we have it available for you to read, chapter 6 of the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith. Now, paragraph 1 deals with man in the state of innocence, what Brandon taught on. So Paragraph 2 of chapter 6 of the Confession deals with what happened at the fall. And I'm going to read paragraphs 2, 3, and 4, where the authors of this confession lay out for you what happened at the fall. And yes, we stole it from the Presbyterians. Praise God. Amen. We redeemed it. It was already good, though. Listen to the theology. 1699 Confession, chapter 6, paragraph 2. By this sin the sin of Adam in the garden. By this sin, our first parents fell from their original righteousness and communion with God. We fell in them. Or as the children's primer said, in Adam's fall, we sinned all. We fell in them. And through this, death came upon all. All became dead in sin and completely defiled in all capabilities and parts of soul and body. So let me just deal with another doctrine here what's often called total depravity. When we talk about the doctrine of total depravity, we are not saying that man is depraved as he possibly can be. That's not at all the case. We can look throughout world history and see men who are far more depraved than others. What we are saying is that the totality of man is depraved. 
that the fall has affected every part of us. This is why you grow old. This is why you age. This is why you get sick. This is why you forget things. This is why you get the cold and the flu. This is why you sin. There's even a doctrine, again, that we just, we're not even familiar with these terms today. The noetic effect of the fall. I just, have, have you heard, now I, I, might, I might test you. Who knows what the noetic effect of the fall is? Just interesting. I see one, two hands. Okay. So even among a, a, a gathering of Reformed Baptist churches, the noetic effect of the fall is the effect of the fall on your mind. You think wrongly. You have bad doctrines. You don't know everything. That's why God revealed what you need to know in his word called the Bible. Getting back to the doctrine of sola scriptura. That scripture is our authority and is sufficient. Now, all of us is defiled, even our minds. Brothers and sisters, this is why we go to the word of God. Because on our own, we will not find the truth. Psalm 19. In the first six verses, it talks about the beauty of creation and the heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork day to day, pours out speech night to night, reveals knowledge. And then in verse 7 of Psalm 19, he says, but the law of the Lord, the Bible, scripture, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. You see, the difference between a sunset and a waterfall and the beauty of mountains and the grandeur of creation is it doesn't tell you how you can be saved from your sin and receive eternal life through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But do you know what does tell you that? This book right here called the Bible. And due to the noetic effect of the fall, due to the effect of the fall on your mind, you don't know these things, but God has revealed them to you in his word. The difference between creation and the word of God is the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. And while sunsets are beautiful, they can't save you from your sin. But God has revealed to you the gospel of Jesus Christ in his written word delivered by his prophets and apostles to us. In paragraph 3, Chapter 6 of the 1689 Confession, the authors go on to say, By God's appointment, they, Adam and Eve, were the root and the representatives of the whole human race. There it is, federalism, right there. Because of this, because they represented us in the garden, because of this, the guilt of their sin was accounted and their corrupt nature passed on to all their offspring who descended from them by ordinary procreation. You know why they say that? Because of Christ conceived of the virgin. Continuing, their descendants, Adam and Eve's descendants, are now conceived in sin, Psalm 51. And they are by, they are by nature children of wrath, Ephesians chapter 2, servants of sin and partakers of death and all other miseries, spiritual, temporal, eternal, unless the Lord Jesus sets them free. Again, come tomorrow and hear more about the doctrine of regeneration. Paragraph 4 of chapter 6 of the 1689 Confession, says all actual transgressions, you know, your acts of sin, right? You say, I wasn't in the garden. I didn't do that. I know. They address that here. All actual transgressions arise from the first corruption, this first corruption. By it, we are thoroughly biased against and disabled and antagonistic toward all that is good. And we are completely inclined toward all that is evil. We're not saying you're depraved as you possibly could be. There are men who are worse than we are. The point is, all of you is fallen in sin and you are completely incapable of saving yourself. You can only be saved by the sovereign, merciful grace of a holy God. Continuing in Romans 5, Paul said at the end of verse 14 that Adam was a type of the one who was to come. Typology is the understanding here that Paul will lay out that there is a parallel between Christ and Adam, the first Adam and the new Adam, Jesus. Verse 15, but the free gift, that is salvation, the free gift is not like the trespass. You see, Adam's trespass had an effect, but Christ's free gift is much greater than Adam's sin. The free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through the one man's trespass, the fall, right? His guilt and his sin nature imputed to us. For if many died through the one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. So here's what he's saying. 
There is a parallel between the imputed righteousness of Christ when we place our faith in him and the imputed guilt of Adam's sin. Now, last week, I had the opportunity to have dinner uh, with some pastor friends that you may know because I was at a conference where they were preaching and they invited me to dinner afterward and I always love these opportunities. And so I'm sitting down with Bobby here. Where's Bobby? I missed you. Bobby and sitting with us are Virgil Walker, Tom Askell and Josh Bice. And I think you were talking Virgil ears off at that moment. And so I said, well, this is a good time for sermon prep knowing that I was going to be preaching to you next week. And so I asked Tom Askell and Josh Price, I said, give me your best, most concise definition of what happened at the fall. What, what, what is original sin and how was the guilt of Adam's sin imputed to us? And they said many helpful things, but they both took me here to Romans 5, which was the text I was already planning to preach, but they helped me understand it much better. So I need to give them credit because they really sharpened my understanding. The parallel here, look at it again. Verse 15, if many died through the one man's trespass, if the fall affected all of us, how much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many? Here's what Paul's saying. You think it's unfair that Adam represented you in the garden and his sin nature and the guilt of his sin is imputed to you? You say that's not fair. Let me tell you what's also not fair. Your salvation. You deserve hell. But God's grace is greater than your sin and Adam's sin. Yes, Adam's sin and its guilt was imputed to you. But how much more great is it that through faith in Christ, the righteousness of Jesus is imputed to you? You see, you can't have imputed righteousness, which is necessary for salvation. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 48, you must be perfect. Just as your heavenly father is perfect. That's the standard. God's not judging on a curve. He expects absolute moral perfection, which is his own very nature. The problem is neither you nor I have attained that, nor are we able to do so. The purpose of the law was not to give us a plan of salvation. The purpose of the law is to show us that we are sinners and we need to run to the Savior. And here's the point, brothers and sisters. When you reject the imputed guilt from Adam's sin... You reject the whole need and the reason why Christ went to the cross. And you reject the very theological foundation for how Christ's righteousness and thus eternal life and salvation are given to you by faith in Jesus. You're undermining the very foundation of the gospel when you reject this. I'm not saying that makes you a heretic. I'm just saying that makes you inconsistent and unable to defend core biblical doctrine. That is not a good place to be. When you're dealing with this pagan, wicked, unbelieving world, we need to understand the Bible rightly and express its theology accurately. Lastly, reading in R.C. Sproul's commentary, which is fantastic. If you've never gotten the gospel of God, Romans, R.C. Sproul's commentary, you need to read it. It's fantastic. And it's really written on a level that anyone who has, say, a high school education should be able to follow it and learn much about the book of Romans. R.C. Sproul's commentary is very helpful and written for the common man. And in it, he explains something that, that is very helpful here. Concerning these verses, he says, okay, so if you're a person who says, well, I understand and I believe that I have a sin nature because of what happened in the fall, but I, I reject this idea that Paul is expressing here that Adam's guilt was imputed to me through his sin and therefore I was born already guilty of sin though I had not yet committed an act of sin on my own. And you say, that doesn't sound right. That's not accurate. Okay, but Paul said in verse 12, how did death come into the world? Through what? Through sin. Okay, so if you believe, say baby Ruth again, not to pick on Brandon's daughter, but that child is born. If you believe that she is perfect and innocent, if that's the case, Why have infants ever died? Some children die in infancy, right? SIDS, it's a a terrible thing. Some of you may have lost an infant. I don't know. And if you have, my heart breaks for you. This is a serious matter, though. Consider it. If there is no imputed guilt from Adam's sin, if that child is innocent of sin and death comes through sin, then how does a sinless child die if Death only comes through sin. That dog won't hunt, ladies and gentlemen. That's incorrect. 
The theology of the Bible is the reason why we all get sick, the reason why we all grow old, the reason why we all die, the reason why your back or your neck aches in the morning when you just sleep on it wrong. You're saying you, you have no idea. Just wait till you get another 30 years. I, I'm, I don't want to learn, but Lord willing, if he leaves me here long enough before he takes me to glory, I'm going to find out. But the reason all that happens is because we're sinners. And the reason why even infants can die, both inside and outside the womb... It's because of imputed guilt from Adam's sin. Brothers and sisters, the theology of the Bible fits together. It is we who try to rip it apart because we don't like some aspects of it. But if we are under the authority of the word of God rather than the other way around, trying to put the Bible under us so that we can tell God what his word means, then this is very plain what Paul is saying. Let's continue on. He talks about how much greater the free gift is than Adam's trespass. Now, verse 16. And the free gift is not like the result of the one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. After the fall, condemnation came over all of humanity. Even creation groans now. I mean, it's affected the weather. This is why we have hurricanes and tornadoes. All of creation was affected by the condemnation flowing out of this original sin in the garden and its effect upon all creation and every one of us who are in Adam. For the judgment following the one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. One act of righteousness covered all those sins. His grace is greater than our sin, the hymn says. Verse 17, for if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man. Again, if you have a problem with this, Paul is saying that because of this one man's trespass, death reigns through sin and it's affected you in this way. If you don't like this doctrine, then you can't believe this other part. That much more will those who receive the abundance of grace by faith in Jesus... Much more, those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Paul's saying you can't have eternal life if, if Adam didn't represent you in the garden and his sin affected you and his guilt was imputed to you. So if you don't like this doctrine, then your hope of eternal life in heaven also goes with it. The two are inseparable. That's Paul's point here. Verse 18, therefore, as one trespass led to the condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men. Now, all men who? You know, it's funny. Sometimes people say, well, all means all, and that's all all means. Oh, really? All means all. Every person who ever lived, right? Okay. Let's read that into verse 18. Therefore, as one trespass led to the condemnation of all men. Okay, I'm okay with that, right? All men are sinners. Except for Jesus, got that, okay. So the one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men. You mean all men who have ever lived have justification in eternal life? Wait a minute. The Bible doesn't teach universalism. The Bible doesn't teach everyone goes to heaven. I know that's the theology of many today, but that's not the theology of Scripture. Amen? The doctrine of hell is biblical. Men die in their sin and they perish and go to eternal hell where they endure the wrath of God forever for their sin. The reason that those who have faith in Christ don't is because Christ paid for their sin in full on the cross. And there is, no now, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8 verse 1. So the all men here are all who are in Christ. All who are in Adam are fallen. That excludes Jesus because he was conceived of the virgin. But all who are in Christ, that is all who have faith in Christ, they receive righteousness and eternal life. Or here's how Paul expressed the same thing in his letter to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22. For as by a man, Adam, for as by a man came death, so by a man has come the resurrection of the dead. Through Adam came death, through Jesus comes the resurrection. They go together. You can't have one without the other. Same principle in 1 Corinthians 15. Now back in Romans 5. As we complete verse 18, Paul is hammering home these two doctrines. Imputed guilt from Adam and imputed righteousness, righteousness through faith in Christ. They go together and they're inseparable. So if you want the righteousness of Christ and the eternal life that come with it, 
You have to accept original sin and the imputed guilt through Adam. Verse 19, for as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. It does not say in verse 19 that you were made a sinner when you first sinned. Read it again. For as by the one man's disobedience, who's that? Adam in the garden. By the one man's disobedience, by Adam's sin in the garden, this is what happened by his disobedience. The many, that's everyone but Jesus, the many were made sinners. Follow the syntax of the verse. By what Adam did in the garden, you were made a sinner. Again, if you don't like that, if you don't want to accept that verse of the Bible, then just be honest about it. If you don't believe the Bible, just say it. This is plain, brothers and sisters. Again, do we stand above the word of God or is the word of God above us and we submit to what God has spoken in his word? As by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Talking about glorification, second half of tomorrow. Again, come tomorrow and learn more. Verse 20. Now, the law came in to increase the trespass. See, the purpose of the law is to prove to us that we are sinners in need of a Savior. Now, that was already true, right? The law was written on Adam's heart before Moses gave the law. But the trespass increased and God is making us see our sin and face it and face how hopeless we are without Jesus so that we will see our need of him. Now the law came to increase the trespass, but but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. You don't like this doctrine of imputed guilt? Well, I have good news for you. The imputed righteousness of Christ and the grace expressed in the cross and the empty tomb and his second coming and the resurrection of the dead on that day. It's so far greater than your sin. It's infinitely greater. I don't care what your sin is. Christ offers you full pardon and forgiveness if you will repent, submit to him, place your faith in him. Your sin is forgiven. His grace is so much greater than your sin. Again, Paul's point is if you don't like this doctrine, then you don't get all these benefits that flow out of what Christ did when he was your representative, when Jesus was your federal head at Calvary. Isn't this amazing? We don't want Adam to represent us in the garden. People reject this doctrine today. But you want Jesus to represent you at the cross. You want his salvation and eternal life, but you don't want to accept what he says about you and your sin and your connection to Adam. Again, you can't have one without the other. Do you see how many times Paul has stated and restated and restated and restated? You know why he says this so much between verses 13 and 20? You know why? Because we're so hard-headed, we'd reject it if he didn't tell it to us about seven or eight times in the same passage. I mean, he is just circling again and again and again like a pilot who just can't find the runway. And he's just, I mean, he is just narrowing in saying, this is what I'm saying. This is what I'm saying. This is what I I know you don't like it. I know you don't want to believe it. But this is the truth. Verse 21, so that. What's the result of his grace being greater than all of our sins so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now this isn't the only passage of scripture that teaches this, but I think it might be the best and the clearest. Brothers and sisters, In Adam's fall, we indeed sinned all. I know you weren't there in the garden. I know you didn't commit the sin, but Adam represented you in the garden, but the good news is Jesus represented you at the cross. And all who repent and place their faith in him will be forever saved. And that is good news. And why you would want to reject these doctrines? Why why you would... Rob glory from Jesus and what he was doing at the cross and why he had to die for you. Do you understand? We, we, we want to minimize our sin. 
And when we minimize our sin, we minimize the glory of the Savior who redeemed us out of that sin. He suffered so much because we sinned so much. He paid exactly for every sin we ever committed at the cross. You realize that? The cup of wrath that he drank at the cross, the cup that he said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass for me, yet not my will but yours be done. And he had to drink the cup of God's wrath, which was the punishment for your sin that you would have endured in eternal hell. He drank the cup of God's wrath on the cross in your place, paying the penalty for your sin so that now the penalty is paid in full. The debt of your sin is paid. It is removed. And through faith in Jesus, he declares you faultless and righteous to stand before his throne. Why would we want to ever reject that glorious theology? Brothers and sisters, this is at the very heart of the gospel. You see, the reason why we need to understand the doctrine of man is because if we don't understand how sinful we are and how desperately we need the Savior, we rob Christ of his glory, we distort the gospel, and we say things to men like, you know, the gospel is God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. What a watered down way to present the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel is God created man perfect, but he rebelled in the garden. And you are the heir of Adam's rebellion. And you came into this world, an enemy of God, hating God, reviling God, sinning against God, bent on your sin, refusing to bend the knee. You were incapable to obey God because you hated him so much. He didn't make you sin. You chose that sin. And it was a part of your very own nature from your forefather, Adam. But the good news is you have a Savior who is far greater than Adam. The second Adam covers the trespass of the first And gives righteousness to all who trust in him. That is why the doctrine of original sin and what happened at the fall is so critical to us getting the gospel right. And explaining it to this lost world who desperately need this glorious savior. We're going to close our service. I'm going to ask Pastor Mark LaCour to come up. Um, The mic's right here, brother. Just get that and flip that on. And I'm going to ask Pastor Mark to close us in prayer. And after Mark prays, you'll be dismissed. And we'll see you back here at 1030 tomorrow. Pray for us, brother. Let's stand. In the old days when the father incurred unpayable debts, guess who went into the poorhouse? The family of the father. When the father struck oil, guess who went into the the mansion? (laughs) The family. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we bless you this evening for these words, these truths, Father, of how we were created as your people to have dominion, how that was lost. We thank you, Father, that in understanding the severity of And the extent of the fallenness, how it opens the door for us to be saved through another Adam. We thank you for that, Father. We ask, Lord, that you would put these truths into our hearts. Father, that we would look to Christ. That, Father, Christ just doesn't even up the books. It's a far greater grace. And we thank you for that. There was sin abounded, grace abounded all the more. It's always all the more. And we thank you for that, Father. We love you. We bless you. Be with us now as we travel. Keep us in your grace. Help us to come back tomorrow and learn even more. We love you and we thank you. For us in Christ's great name we pray. Amen.